Good afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct honor to welcome you to the Association of the United States Army Institute of Land Warfare panel on out-of-the-box thinking, meeting the requirements for Force 2025 and beyond. The Institute of Land Warfare is proud to continue its long-standing tradition of facilitating shared dialogue on critical issues. With its unique composition and highly germane topic, the panel promises to deliver and make this a compelling event. Our out-of-the-box thinking moderator is Ms. Mary Miller, will lead the discourse today. Ms. Miller is a highly respected member of the s and community, currently serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Research and Technology. In her position, she is responsible for 16 laboratories and centers with more than 12,000 scientists and engineers dedicated to empowering, unburdening, and protecting the soldiers. Our panel chair, Panel chair today is Lieutenant General Bill Phillips. Lieutenant General Phillips is the principal military deputy to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, and the Army's Director of Acquisition Career Management. With his long title comes a long responsibility to keep our soldiers well equipped for any mission they are called upon to perform. That is why he is the lead today for today's discussion on maintaining Army's decisive edge for tomorrow. Lieutenant General Phillips will now introduce the panel members. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to thank uh, General Sullivan, AUSA, this great organization, and all of you that are here, thank you for supporting AUSA. And I want to also recognize our CASAs that are here for all the great work they do in support of the Secretary of the Army. I see Bruce McDonald and my friend Joe Fitzgerald over to the right. Thanks for everything you do. It's uh, indeed an honor for me to be here today uh, and to be able to share our thoughts with you, but most importantly, an honor to uh, be a part of this very distinguished panel uh, of uh, extraordinary members who are going to share their thoughts on, on how we can make this great Army that we have today uh, the Army of the future in 2025. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Pete Palmer. Pete may have walked off stage. Uh, Pete, thank you for being here today and helping to be a key part of actually establishing this panel for AUSA. Pete is a West Point graduate. He retired as a Brigadier General and now works for General Dynamics. And as many of you know, Pete is a talker. And uh, the good thing about that is I've known him for many years and he's always right 99.9% .9 of the time. And he's doing the same kind of work today for GD. If you, he, Pete wouldn't say this, but if you haven't talked to them about the edge and the work that they're doing, with his project that he's running, The Edge, I would certainly encourage you to do that. I found that to be very helpful as we work through a lot of issues uh, and, and strategies within ASALT. To my right is Ms. Leanne Corrette. She is a Vice President and General Manager of the Vertical Lift at Boeing for Military Aircraft. Uh, before this promotion, uh, I got to know Leanne when she was running uh, helicopter operations in Philadelphia, where they delivered the Chinook aircraft to the U.S. Army and to Special Operations Aviation. Did a lot of work with Lean Six Sigma, uh, supporting 18 countries that f uh, fly the Chinook helicopter today. And I've always wondered why she had so much energy. So I had to go out and do some research, and I found out the answer. It's Diet Coke. I don't have ten, any. 10 or 15, and you didn't bring it with they you, but 10 or 15 that. a day is what I understand. <laughs> Uh, my good friend Keith Walker, who's here with us, you just heard from Keith. As General Sullivan said, he's Deputy Commanding General for, Future, for Futures and the Director Army Capability Integration Center. Oh. Keith is a West Point graduate who enjoys a strong cup of coffee, and if you listen to his presentation, you know that he found the coffee on the floor. I did not. <laughs> I'm still looking for it, but Keith did. Uh, let me just add that Keith has been a great partner for me for so many years as colonels together on the Army staff in Iraq together in Baghdad and elsewhere, at White Sands in the Pentagon and now RKIC in the Pentagon, ASALT together. So Keith, welcome. Dr. John Fratimico, Jr., the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Force Surveillance and Reconnaissance at Group Lidos. John earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. John is a smart guy <laughs> and is as Keith and I found out today, I spent 30 minutes with John. I understood about 10 percent. I'm sure Keith understood about 100 percent. But he is a smart guy, and he has a very hectic schedule traveling all across the U.S., visiting your labs and so forth. But your staff told me that you sometimes forget to eat lunch as late as 4 or 5 in the afternoon. 
It is 429 in Huntsville. Feel free to have your lunch if you haven't had it yet, John. Uh, Dale Orman is here with us as well. Dale is the director of the U.S. Army Research Development and Engineering Command. Dale is a former Navy submariner, and he is a graduate of the Naval Academy. And he's probably one of the smartest folks up here because Dale left the Navy to come to the Army, which was a great move. Uh, and the Army was even smarter because they put Dale in charge of all of research development and engineering, even though he does have a degree in English literature from the Naval Academy. But Dale is absolutely qualified and ready and is doing a great job at AMC RDECOM. Our last uh, panel member is Mr. Nick Bobay. He is a president of Night Vision and Tactical Communication Systems Division of Excellus. Nick is an Indiana native with a bachelor's and master's degree in business administration from the Indiana Institute of Technology. I think it's also important to say that uh, Nick was also a part of the Air Force at one point in time. He's also a smart person because he came over to the Army as well. Uh, so really, in actuality, we have all three services represented today on this panel. Nick also spent some time in UK, so there's also an international flavor to go along with this panel. Before I do turn it over to uh, Miss Mary Miller, I want to, I just want to let all the Alabama and Auburn uh, folks that are out there note that Mary's wearing orange, uh, Tennessee orange, not Auburn orange, uh, but she is a graduate of the University of Tennessee as well. And I think, go Vols. I think that's part of the reason that she has been so successful in uh, the science and technology arena. But let me put it like this. Those of you who know Mary Miller know that when she talks, it's like your go the E.F. Hutton commercial that all of you had heard. It, when Mary Miller talks science and technology, everybody in the room listens. Because she has been doing this for so many years since I have known her, going back many years uh, to PEO Aviation many years ago, she is brilliant in the way that she strategizes and is, and is developing the strategy, really, for, uh, for Ms. Shu and for all of ac uh, acquisition, logistics, and technology. And Mary, over to you. Thank you, sir. And thank it's, thanks to AUSA for um, supporting this panel and allowing me to be the moderator. Obviously, I speak so well of s and I get to moderate the panel. I don't get to speak on the panel, but it's going to be kind of interesting. What we're going to do is things are be a little bit different. This is a panel that's late in the day, and we're going to keep it lively and active. You're not going to get a presentation from every member of the panel. This is going to be interactive question and answer with the audience, and I'm relying on you to ask the questions. We'll get the panel started with a question each, just to get you the flavor of what we're going to be asking and how they have to respond. I know, General Walker, you had a lot of hard questions already. That does not exempt you from getting questions here. Um, you know, and if you want to solicit you know, a particular question to a particular individual, just say so, and we'll ask that and then spread it out to the panel. To the panel members, if there is a question that's been asked of another panel member and you're interested in putting your perspective on it, either government or industry, weigh in, just wave your hand, and I'll call on you to, to weigh in. So now I will set the stage for this panel. As you heard, the title is Out of the Box Thinking, Meeting the Requirements for the Force of 2025 and Beyond. And we have a panel here that has a very large breadth of experience and perspective to kind of weigh in on that thoughts for the future of out of the box thinking. We all have a common goal, and that common goal is to ensure the Army of the future remains the strongest and most capable Army in the world. And that is something we're all united here in making sure happens. But we also understand that budget and manpower issues make business as usual impossible. You've heard many speakers today talk about the fact that we are going to have to make changes. What you'll hear on our panel in response to the questions is how we think we might be able to get at some of those changes. We need that out-of-the-box thinking, and we need to be open to that out-of-the-box thinking. Often when we say innovation and we talk about out-of-the-box, people think only material solutions. But we've got to be broader than that. It's not just the material. That's almost the easy part. That's what science and technology is all about. But we're talking about out-of-the-box thinking on 
ways to employ new technology, what are those new concepts and doctrine that we may have to face as we downsize our army and our force structure? Ways to incentivize industry and partner with them to the best of both the Army and the industry partner. You heard some of that in General McQuiston's speech on how we can partner and certainly the panel that came up after that. We're looking to streamline our test and evaluation process and gain efficiencies in that, a new way of doing business. We have to find ways to retain the best and the brightest, to incentivize the workforce to stay and work in the Army or work in the defense industry that supports the Army. And that's getting to be a challenge, as you've seen what's happened in the last year. We've faced furloughs. We certainly have pay salary freezes. And we have mitigated the people's ability to go to conferences from an S&T perspective, which has been a big detriment to what we can do in getting our younger workforce into their profession. We also need to find ways to build a workforce that can think outside of the box. Because if you've been in the Army for a while, you start to think like the Army thinks, and you understand their context. And sometimes you set aside what might be a good idea because we've never done it that way. And we need to challenge ourselves frequently. And one of the ways we do that is by soliciting input from academia, from industry, from foreign entities, foreign partners, and our allies to make sure that we understand what is in the art of the possible. But even then, we have to be willing to implement a new way of doing business, and that continues to be a challenge. So that kind of streamlines what we'll talk about today. And as I said, I will start giving every one of the panel at least one question, and then it'll get a little lively and a little fast paced as I anticipate questions from the audience. So the first question goes to our chair, General Phillips. What is Army acquisition trying to achieve for the force 2025 and beyond? And how does Army s and fit into your plans? Mary, great question. I think you've already answered some of that. Uh, I'll make this as short as possible, but I think this is important. Acquisition is going to be an enabler to do all the things that General Walker just described that the Army wants to achieve by, by 2025. We are an enabler. But it begins with the vision, the vision of the Secretary of the Army, the vision of the Chief of Staff of the Army. What is their vision for 2025, which TRADOC, ARCIC, and many others are going to translate into requirements requirements for basic research, for applied research. And then we take those requirements, we work with the S&T community, we develop a strategy that Mary Miller is working on with Dale Orman. The RDEX are involved in this, but this is also important. It just can't be the government or the RDEX because that's not enough. It has to be a balance with industry. So we have to go internal to the government in some cases and we should go external to the government in other cases and leverage what our industry partners can produce, develop, patent, and potentially provide to the Army to make sure that we can achieve success on that. But here's the other piece that, that we're not so good at either, that we have to get better at. We have to get better at transitioning basic and applied research into formal programs of record. Because acquisition is not going to be successful, very successful, in achieving the vision of the Chief and the Secretary if we don't transition those programs into programs of record that puts capability in the hands of our soldiers. That is most important. And all of us have a piece in this. Mary mentioned it. Uh, we want to make sure that we have overmatch with soldiers. We never want our soldiers to, to – we want them to always have overmatch. We don't want them ever to go into a fair fight ever go into a fair fight. All of that has to be synchronized and integrated between the vision, the requirements work, the science and technology, the acquisition strategy that goes into programs of records that delivers capability into the hands of soldiers at some point in time. And the last comment I would make, and Mary alluded to this, if we don't focus on science, technology, engineering, and math in America, we're going to end up short in some cases. So all of us, I know industry partners are working on this and the government is as well. 
we have to go out and encourage our young men and women that are not, they're in grammar school actually, and maybe even younger than that, and encourage them, grammar school, junior high, high school, to really encourage them to, to uh, sign up for math, physics, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Correct. As we heard earlier today, FORCE 2025 and beyond is focused on a leaner, more agile, and expeditionary force. The Joint Multi-Role Technology Demonstrator is an s and initiative which exemplifies this drive towards a leaner and more expeditionary army. It also exemplifies out-of-the-box thinking in your partnership with Sikorsky. Can you tell us a bit more about what you are doing differently on this program that embodies this out-of-the-box thinking? Thanks, Mary. Joint Multi-Role Tech Demonstrator is our opportunity to change the future. And it starts with those who are developing it. We have taken that team in whole, and we have separated them from both the Boeing plant and the Sikorsky plant. We have co-located them together in their own environment, away from the bureaucracies of the two large companies. In addition to that, we have handpicked every member of our team. And in many cases, you would think we would handpick the smartest person, uh, the most experienced person. Instead, we have staffed this program with more than 40% of the folks having less than 10 years of industry service. And the reason is to think differently. I think, Mary, you said it, uh, it was extremely profound. We have to think out of the box about how we're going to think out of the box. We can't do this by executing an order. We have to capture the hearts, the minds, the imaginations, and we have to allow folks to see the art of the possible for creating that next generation program that they can be a part of and hopefully at some point fly on and retire on as life goes on. But it is all about the culture we create, and it's all about ensuring that the bureaucracy that tends to come with large businesses and complex programs to get out of the way of those with the ideas. And we need to have an opportunity and a willingness to be persuaded. Because if we're not willing to be persuaded about new ideas, nobody will come up with new ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. General Walker, the Chief of Staff's vision for the future talks about fundamentally changing the Army beyond 2025. What does this mean for both the operational and institutional Army? Well, primarily, and, and I mentioned this in remarks a little earlier, you know, we, we are one-thirds tooth, two-thirds tail. What if we were, and I don't know if this is the right answer, but what if we were 50-50? Well, that means if you had 100, if you have 100 people, if, then, then 50 of them have, have rifles and are on the ground, and 50 of them are doing something else. Currently, we only have 30 with rifles on the ground if we only had 100, and 70 percent doing something else. So as force structures are driven down, because for budgets and other reasons, if you're one-third tooth and one-third tail, you don't have a lot of options about having soldiers on the ground. So how do we get after that? And, um, and the thinking is, again, for that, that decade of 2030 to 40 to fundamentally change the nature of the force. Um, what are things that we could do? And, and some of these we can actually do earlier. So I'll, I'll just give you some thoughts. Um, we have um, lots of trucks in the Army. And today the technology exists for autonomous, for trucks to autonomously follow unmanned. That's a lot of people who are truck drivers uh, if, it's, if they're in you know, truck companies at echelons above brigade. So there's, there's opportunities there that would allow part of the tail to come down. Um, 3D printing. If, if you look at our supply system and you go in the field where the, um, you know, where the ASL is in the brigade support area, um, if you had 3D printing, that could replace a lot 
of spare parts that are forward and on the ground, a lot of soldiers and a lot of trucks to do that. Um, un, if you had, I mentioned an unmanned tank, a robotic tank. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm still stressing over the fact that we lost the horse in about 1940, but um, <laughs> a robotic tank's probably a pretty good idea. Um, that, that's that many fewer soldiers you have to have. It doesn't have to have as much weight as we currently have. You know, our armored vehicles, you know, 60 to 70 percent of their weight is in the armor. Um, so it's not to say you don't have the propulsion system and the lethality system, but we do have issues with armor, and that's why I mentioned material sciences. So anyway, uh, Mary, I just wanted to offer a couple of s sample things. That So remember, midterm, the chief would like us to apply some technologies by 2025 that will allow us to lean out the force and um, have equal to or greater than capability. 2025 is right around the corner. That means it's a technology that's got to be, say, TRL, TRL level six today. And, and I would offer that perhaps autonomous, uh, you know, robotic trucks, um, perhaps 3D printing is possible by 2025. And then broader to the point of, uh, of um, in the deep future, the decade of 2030 to 40, fundamentally changing the nature of the force. Um, I, I think it would likely take that long to have uh, robotic tanks and do man-to-man -man teaming, but that's another example of a way that we could get after that. Thank you, sir. Dr. Fratamico, can you describe how technology can be used in new ways to provide agility to the warfighter given the uncertainties we have in the environment in which we will be fighting? Sure, as I was listening to General Walker's comments earlier about the future force having to train, equip, and to deploy directly into an operational environment without the benefit of having a significant forward deployed unit, I was thinking about that from the perspective of tactical ISR, in particular, um, airborne ISR and what would be the requirements say, on a system to achieve that, what combination of technologies and business practices would, would enable that. And what occurred to me as he was talking is that we don't know an awful lot about the environment we would have to go into at least much in advance. Would it be foliated or desert? Would it be mountainous or flat? Would it be urban or rural and so forth? Would we be looking for targets on the ground or significantly under the ground? So there's a lot of things we don't know about the particular sensor modality. I think there's, if we kind of look at things we do know and don't know, we do know if we developed a, a tactical platform, it would have to have a small footprint. It would have to operate beyond line of sight um, with presumably fairly limited bandwidth and therefore would have to have a lot of onboard processing to, to be able to provide data to the warfighter with low latency um, even given the limited communications. It would have to provide persistence and wide area imagery of some type, but we don't know what modality. It presumably would have to have long endurance. Um, and it presumably would have to employ whatever the most current technology at the time was. Listening to General Phillips' comment about when we have technology, we can't take a long time to get it into the field. So what it really calls for, in my view, is a system of system approach to, say, tactical collection platforms, where the, let's say the aircraft in that case has a number of attributes, its endurance, its ability to house significant processing, its beyond line of sight comms and so forth, but it's not spec down to the level of what particular sensor it's going to accommodate, what modalities, how it's going to process the data. And therefore, what the requirement, I think, becomes one is one of a system of systems where it's built to be adaptive to plug and play, let's say, different collection methods, different sensors, plug and play not just mechanically, but also in terms of electrical and data and so forth. And if we do that, then I think we can take sensors very quickly from even the laboratory and em employ those. And, and I think we have seen some instances of those in the um, in the Afghan concept where we've uh, utilized sidecar concepts to get sensors employed very quickly, but we haven't really taken the whole system of systems approach to get interoperability um, across all these types. Thank you. Mr. Ormond, 
As a director of RDE Command, you have responsibility for almost 75% of the Army's s and resources. One would assume that the s and community is well positioned to champion this campaign for innovation. That said, history has shown that innovation is often difficult to get accepted within the Army. Would you like to share your thoughts on how we get more innovation in the Army and what it will take to be accepted? Yeah, so here's some things that we're, we're looking at, and I'm going to steal blatantly from Dr. Tom Russell, who's uh, the director of Army Research Laboratory. So it was mentioned by General McQuistian earlier this morning about the open com concept that we're looking at ARL, and it's really about how do we turn ARL, which already is, does tremendous things for our Army in terms of innovation, but really increase innovation, increase our access, in a sense, to almost the crowdsourcing idea. And Tom's idea is to create this system at ARL up in Adelphi as a pilot that we would look to expand potentially across to RDCOM to the other to the RDEX where industry and academia and our government researchers do work in the same facilities. Academics, they come and they build facilities, they build laboratories, industry does, and we on this campus we have people working in the same laboratories side by side. Potentially we even have part-time government employees who teach academics for six months of the year, eight months of the year, and then they work as laboratory employees. So he expands the size of his workforce and the people who are interacting to really create this source of innovation, which multiple ideas, multiple backgrounds coming together, focused on specific problems, generating new ideas. And then ARL as this generator of ideas, pushes these ideas out to the Artics, because the Artics really are engineering centers. And they take those engineering ideas, those ideas that come out of the innovation, engineer those ideas, we apply the systems engineering approach to them, and we turn them into prototypes. Because we have prototype integration facilities at each of our RDEX. And at that point, now we're building prototypes not to deploy, but to learn, to write specifications, to inform industry on what's in the art of the possible, what kind of ideas we have. So we, the Army, develop the technical expertise. We help write the specifications through the testing of these prototypes. We work with industry on the manufacturing issues and the integration issues, and we transfer this to industry, and they build capabilities that they sell back to us. This process also enables us to feed ARCIC with the ideas that then become the requirements that go, through the, that go up and get approved by the department and then get pushed over to the acquisition side. It feeds those ideas into the PEO community and the PMs, so they look at, hey, is this a new idea that we need to build a new system for, or is this an idea that helps us to modernize the current system uh, to make it more capable, to get back to that idea of we don't want our soldiers, to, we always want our soldiers to be engaged in an unfair fight. And how do we enable that to happen? And so the more we can do this across all of our DCOM and all of our RDEX, starting with this pilot at ARL, uh, we create, as Tom describes, this ecosystem of people who are interacting, coming in, leaving, and providing great ideas, taking those ideas back to their institutions, bringing ideas back to us to help make us better. But that's one of those things that we're looking at. How do we do this differently? Thank you very much. Mr. Bobet, Excellus has also exemplified the concept of innovation. As a spin out of the well known ITT, Excellus needed to establish its role in the community. Would you explain a little bit about your strategic focus at Excellus and how it aligns and supports the Army's objectives? Sure. So, as, as we became an a independent, publicly traded company uh, at about the same time as, as the drawdowns uh, started to, to occur, we had to look at ourselves and say, uh, where are we going to focus our, our uh, resources and, and take this new, new defense company and, and, and grow it? So we looked at, at the uh, focus that the uh, DOD, Army in particular, uh, is, is having or likely to have going forward. So we created or in, or, and creating now what we call our uh, strategic growth platforms. These are areas that uh, uh, the general mentioned earlier uh, in the networking areas primarily. Uh, we're, we're very rich in sensors, uh, space, airborne and ground sensors, uh, networking capabilities, secure communications, and how do we reform ourselves into a company that's not just uh, looking at for, for RFPs to come out and selling boxes and, and goggles, for example, but solutions that uh, are broader uh, in nature around the, the, uh, the network-centric 
um, uh, future that, that we've heard both generals uh, speak of uh, today. So um, that's where we're headed in our thinking strategically uh, to, to assure that we're, we're, we're adapting to the new environment. And as we all know, with the shrinking defense budget, uh, the, the, the Army's uh, commitments uh, are more difficult to, to meet with uh, limited budgets. The, the flow through to industry obviously is, is fairly linear, so there's a lot less investment that each company is going to have to, to make these uh, targets. So I think some of the other innovation ideas that you've heard from the panel members are very critical to making sure that the, the entire pot of money for investment is focused very specifically on the, the, the problems that, that the Army would like to solve. Thank you very much. So this is a question I'll throw out to General Walker and Dale Ormond, and anyone else can weigh in as they want to. What does the Army expect enemies to use UAVs for during the future battles, and what are we doing now to defeat enemy UAVs? Would you read that first part again? What does the Army expect enemies to use UAVs for in future battles? Um, I, I'd expect them to use them in the same way that we would. Um, so you have um, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is to um, launch missiles at us, neither of which I'm excited about someone else being able to do. Well, hopefully Dale can answer the second part with, and what are we doing about protecting ourselves against enemy UAVs? Yeah, so a couple of things. So um, in the strategic plan that we wrote for RDCOM with myself and all the RDEX and ARL, one of the director's initiatives we came up with was counter UAS. Because I, I was at uh, Combined Arms Center as the deputy, the commanding general, when they did the first full uh, combined arms rotation at uh, JMRC. And... Uh, the 82nd Brigade jumped into uh, Fort Polk. And the first thing he noticed is that uh, fiber cable didn't come with them. And they're going, wait a second, our computers, we don't, where, where's, our, where's, where's our connectivity? It's one of the next things they noticed is, is the op Ford ran a UAV and was watching them doing everything they were doing. They're going, holy cow, now what did we do? Um, so one of the things that we're going to do, and uh, Amerdeck has the lead for this because they do primarily counter U.S., but in very much in conjunction with CERDEC and with <laughs> ARL and with RDEC, let's go back and scope all of the UAV threats across all the spectrum and look at what are our options at Echelon to provide capabilities. Where do we already have capabilities in the system? What are the things that we have in the pipeline? Where are the gaps? And what kind of things can we do everywhere from the division all the way down to the squad? And then sit down with the Fire Center of Excellence, the Maneuver Center of Excellence, and go over our analysis and see if we can't come up with things. I mean, there's lots of great ideas from very I mean, one of the things we need to avoid is shooting a half a million dollar missile to go shoot down a $10,000 UAV. That's not a very good exchange ratio. But, for example, Jerry Melendez at uh, Ardeck is, has a mortar system that he can put on the back of a Humvee. Well, maybe we could, it's a direct fire mortar system. Maybe we could put an old anti-aircraft frag round in that and with a, the right kind of radar and tracking system be able to shoot something down that we could give the platoon level a very cheap, very easy system to take out a low-flying, slow-flying UAV. So there's a whole host of options that we're going to go look at and, and then work with ARCIC and their team at the COEs to put together uh, some options and see what we can get after this issue. Thank you very much. Following on the UAV theme. So General <coughs> Phillips, I'm reading a question. This isn't me saying this. In keeping with the belief that the last pilot has already been born, referring to unmanned aviation systems, can we say, or will we ever truly be able to say, our last combat arms soldier has been born? General Walker, like you're looking at me. <laughs> no. And, and the reason why, Mary, is um, Con conflict is fundamentally about people. Um, we will have lots of robotics. We will need lots of robotics. We'll need lots of unmanned platforms, air and ground. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, conflict is about winning a clash of wills. It's about influencing 
another population and other people, the security forces that that of the country of that people, um, or the government in which that people lives in. Um, and, and that takes, that is a human thing, that is a personal engagement. Um, we have, um, I think we have lots of evidence of, uh, we went through a period of uh, clean war theories. Uh, we see some of those, some of those theories rising again. Um, but I'm going back to before the turn of the century, late 90s, early 2000, of um, when we talked about rapid, decisive operations, um, effects-based operations. Uh, but, but I think uh, that, that the reality of conflicts that have happened since then has exposed the limitations of clean war theories, and it's because it is all about the clash of wills, and that requires another human being. So I don't think we'll ever reach the point um, where we won't need the man or woman soldier to engage um, with security forces, populations, or their governments. Well, let's also, uh, I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to take advantage of being somebody here. Uh, <laughs> it's also exposed the dichotomy and the tension between technology enabling us to do more with technology and manpower disappearing from the battlefield. And if you go into urban areas, the problem is that you have to occupy ground, you have to occupy space, or you can't influence these urban areas. And uh, we operated on the principle that, look, I'll uh, be able to save manpower. And better is smaller is not better. Better is better. But you have to be careful how you define better, because less manpower for land war is, takes you down a bad, uh, I think, down a bad road, or a road from which you can't recover if the war changes. Sir, I think that's a good point. If I, could, if I could just add one thing. First of all, is that a process foul if General Sullivan writes a question and he sends it to the panel? I don't know. I saw General Sullivan writing earlier. Sir, sir no, it's not a process foul. <laughs> but, but something, I just want to pick up on this discussion. Something that a person brings to the table is something called human curiosity. That if you, if you try to define that, it is incredibly difficult to define. But it's priceless. And General Sullivan, just as you said, you can't take this too far. And one of the areas where I think we're just beginning to really experiment and understand is what we are doing with man-to-man -man teaming. And I know Kevin's in the room, and I don't think Kevin or the person that follows him and the next one or the next one, the person who's, there hasn't been a person born yet who's not going to go and be a, an aviator and a pilot in an aircraft, at least not in my lifetime and beyond, well beyond. But in man-to-man -man teaming, what we've learned between the Apache aircraft and flying with shadow UAV systems or predators ha has really been extraordinary. But if you can imagine that the pilot is, in the, is on the airfield, the UAV is over the target, and the pilot is actually controlling the UAV before they actually crank the engines. APU may be running. They crank the engines, they go, and they, they uh, infiltrate two uh, the area where they're going to engage and hopefully destroy the target. Maybe they could destroy the target with the UAV. I don't know. Maybe not. But when they get there, the pilot and co-pilot flying that aircraft bring something very special to the battlefield, and it's human curiosity. That target, is it a civilian? Is it something that we wouldn't engage? Is there a church next to where you couldn't see through the UAV, there, where there's uh, actually a church or a mosque or something that's there, I don't know. But the human putting eyes on target brings something special to the battlefield. I don't know if we'll ever completely get away from that. Will we take advantage of technology? Absolutely. But I don't think we'll ever get away from that. My thoughts. Any other comments? Just, I think it relates a little bit to one of the questions earlier about the services and their unique perspectives, and I think you provided an answer that the Army is a little different 
and the Air Force and the Navy and that people live on the land and that's the, the domain of the Army. I think that impacts the answer to this, that you're fighting in the area where people live. I, I happen to agree. The whole human dimension construct that TRADOC has identified and pushed is because we are a land and ground force and it's very important that we engage with the people and sending an unmanned asset to negotiate peace does not seem to work. All right. This is a question to industry, and, and I'm going to start combining a couple because I got lots of questions already. Um, to our industry panel members, with the downturn in the defense budget, how do we incentivize industry to continue investing for the future of our Army? Um, I'll go first. So we uh, in Boeing are actually taking advantage of the downturn. We've actually increased our investment spend because we believe that this is a rare opportunity where we'll be able to have some technology breakthroughs and look at our investments from a life cycle approach so that we're not looking just at an acquisition cost, but we're also looking at the support cost that goes along with it. And as time goes on, as the downturn ends and we see the uptick, we'll be ready not only with the next generation of technologies, technologies that we have, will have been able to prove out on current platforms, as well as look forward to migrating roadmaps for future programs. The downturn shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone, especially not to anyone in industry. Historically, you can look following any conflict and see that we're going to go through a reduction in spend. The ability is to predict the reduction in spend and to get in front of it. And we spent a lot of time doing that and looking at how we can get more aggressive on our costs, how we can bring affordability in, and how we can look at breaking Augustine's law. If you look historically, every new development program costs more than the one that came before it. That is unending and it's unaffordable. There would be no more development programs if that trend continues. So how are we going to get smarter like the automobile industry? How are we going to be able to incorporate change faster um, and more efficiently? Why should any of us be satisfied that it takes 10 years to get from a TRL-6 to the field? The fact that that's okay is what's wrong with all of us in industry. We need to figure out how we get from a TRL-6 to the field in less than two. And that's what we're focused on in Boeing. And we, we have a similar approach as well. The, the downturn, of course, uh, we all saw coming. Uh, and it's good that, that the wars are ending and our troops are coming home. But the dynamics change. And so um, much like Boeing, we're increasing our investment at the moment uh, in, in the areas I mentioned previously. We look at the, at the landscape, talk to our customers, and try to understand you know, where, where the puck is going to be you know, shot to and head that direction. So through restructuring, we created headroom on our investment side. Uh, and the, 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 the question, I believe, was you know, what, what can the Army do to, to, uh, to help the industry and the, the focus? I think we had heard some ideas uh, just uh, today that, that are very important. One of the things that I struggle with is, is sometimes a lack of clarity where, where the Army, our primary customer, where they're really trying to go, when will they buy, when, when will the uh, uh, picture clarify a bit so that we can know where to invest. I think in, in certain areas of, of DOD, there's more clarity than others. Um, and when there's that lack of clarity, you know, the, uh, capital will not flow until there's some, a little bit more certainty. Um, uh, of where, where there might be a, of a good chance of return on that investment. So we are increasing investment in the areas that we see uh, growth potential. We've heard about uh, dis discussions on UAVs. We have uh, uh, and are investing in those network areas, the communications, the sensors, the control, command and control, making the soldier more lethal and, and more survivable, and also a, a ground sensor, if you will. So we, we anticipate those kind of uh, needs and work closely with our customers. But I think in general, if, if the, the, uh, the clarity comes back in some of the areas, it'll, it'll uh, increase the investment from uh, industry once they're uh, a little bit more 
um, uh, positive uh, chance of a return. Dale? Yeah, I, I just would like to add a little something, because I think part of this revolves around the idea of risk. And one of the things that we, we had in the Army in the future is the rate of technology, if the rate of technology continues to increase and the tech availability of technology through the internet and other things becomes more ubiquitous, the challenge is how do we learn to accept more risk? And the example I would just give is the SAPI plate. The adversary lives at the leading edge of technology because he's not afraid to fail. He doesn't worry about failing. His happy play fails, he says, I can buy the next one from somebody else and put it on the next soldier. We spent six months on Capitol Hill with hearings and television interviews. The soldier had nothing before. We gave him something better than he had, but we did not articulate the risk in a way that allowed for that. In certain areas, such as software and cyber, stuff that comes out of the laboratory almost immediately has to move into operations or it loses its effectiveness. If you, we wait a year or two years to deploy it, the, the capability we develop is now overcome by events, it's no longer effective and it's not added. So I think one of the things we the Army have to do that would help industry is if we could identify areas where we're willing to take more risk from absolute perfect every time to some degree of recognition that may not work all the time, then that gives them broader space for making investments and bringing capabilities that for, uh, for us to consider and buy and put into the fight. Yeah, it's interesting. My comment was going to be a little bit related to risk as well, but maybe from a contractor perspective. So that perspective would be we invest because in, and especially in today's environment of it being a little bit more difficult to win each competition, we have to demonstrate that we have a superior cost risk solution to win work. So how do we do that? As I think you've heard several of the folks say, we kind of pick the areas where we want to excel and then those become our platforms, whether our platform be a processor or an airplane or what have you, and we build on those platforms so that we can offer a final solution at least cost, predictable schedule, and lowest risk. As far as what impedes our ability to, to invest, I think it is the uncertainty or lack of predictability. Um, when there's a, an intent for a solicitation that ultimately does not come out and we've made a large investment that's not used, you know, those are the types of things that tend to make us hold back when there's predictability about um, effort coming out, being competed, and it's in one of those areas where we feel like we have a, uh, a platform to stand on, I think most of us in industry are prepared to, to make the investments required to demonstrate low cost, low, low risk solutions. I, I would add the comment that the Army, in undertaking the 30-year strategic planning efforts that we've done under MISHU and as part of the long-range investment requirements analysis, we are trying to give industry that longer look of what is going to be important to the Army and how and when we see technology insertion opportunities coming, either through engineering change proposals or new programs to replace existing platforms. As we continue to develop the concepts for Force 2025 and beyond, you will see that start to proliferate that longer range planning to give more stability to what we would hope to be our IRAD investments uh, to support the Army. So this continues with the um, discussion of incentivizing industry. And it says, given the operational environment General Walker described, how will the Army establish an open, collaborative environment with commercial industry which drives advanced materials development today and that will be required for strategic expeditionary maneuvers? So they've hearkened on the need for advanced materials there. They go on to say, transformation for fundamentally new materials may take eight to ten years. Protection of intellectual property in order to incentivize industry to invest in the long term and R&D may be an option. Comments? Well, I mean, this, just, this is what ARL does, really. ARL is our material scientist for that basic research. And they work with academics. They work with universities through the Army Research Office. Uh, they work worldwide in trying to establish uh, connections. And then if we are able, actually successful, to create this situation with the open campus, some of those things that we're going to have to work through is intellectual property rights. Who owns the property rights? 
Are they crater-like things where we share the intellectual property? Um, but it really is, ARL is the one, in, is the organization inside the Army who does those things, and those are the things that we would work through Tom, Tom Russell with uh, this idea of the open campus to create that collaborative environment uh, with industry and academia to develop those new materials. Uh, and I would add from an industry perspective uh, to some of the earlier points made, it is critical to understand if industry is going to invest and expend not knowing if there's a future requirement, that industry is going to expect to retain their intellectual property rights. And I do believe that that's an opportunity for improvement and an opportunity to incentivize and partner and how we manage through those conversations. Because I would contest that it's not quite as black and white as we give it all or we retain it all. And there needs to be understanding of the future uh, results and implications as a result of industry developing that IP and then what happens over the life cycle uh, that the IP is used. I would add just one comment. There has never been a greater need for us to have a dialogue between industry and the Army in terms of what our requirements are, what we want industry to be working on to help us than there is today. This is the greatest need that I think we've had for, for many years, many decades actually. And the reason is, Ms. Hsu in her comments this morning talked about the budget and the challenges that we face and how much our modernization budget has gone down. And she used a figure that was beyond 20 percent. And if you look at the projection that we had two years ago to what we're executing today, you could almost double that figure. One thing where we have sustained funding, though, is in our S&T budget. It's almost the same as it was previously, down slightly, but not a whole lot. Those are precious dollars. So we have to have sessions between the U.S. Army with all the players in the room, between Arkeck, Keith's group, Dale Orman, Mary, ourselves, to sit down and talk about what our needs are, our requirements, and have in industry working on the right kinds of things. And I'll put a plug in for AMC. I spent all day with AMC General Vi, Pat McQuistian, Don Nerger, nine PEOs that we had here yesterday talking to over 300 industry partners at a, at a site uh, at Redstone. It was an incredible dialogue. That was the best dialogue I've seen for, I'll just, it's a small business conference, the best dialogue I had ever seen. We need more of those kinds of sessions where we can talk frankly about the needs of industry, the needs of the Army, how can we align better, synchronize better, and make sure every dollar of IRAD maybe matches up with some funding that we might be able to provide and delivers capability at the end of the day? We have to do this. Can I make one comment, Mary, because you, you helped me learn some of this. I, I've discovered um, with regard to basic research, which are some of the things that we're, we're talking about we need to do in that deep future decade of 2030 and 2040. I mean, for the most part, industry doesn't do basic research. Um, the Army does basic research. Uh, universities do basic research. You know, DARPA does some basic research. Um, but industry doesn't do that, so we have to look elsewhere. Now, what, is, what I've learned and some of the things that have frustrated me in this regard is you know, really successful um, breakthroughs have had national level efforts. I mean, the Manhattan Project was roughly, if I remember right, in real terms, four and a half billion dollars over about a five year period. Uh, the Apollo program ran for 11 years, a nationally funded, I, and I can't remember how many billions a year it, 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 that was. Uh, similar, the stealth um, technology. Um, as, as you all know, I'm very interested in material science for the deep future. Uh, there isn't a national effort, um, and there's roughly about a billion and a half dollars a year nationwide, which is an estimate of a collection of independent efforts and in basic research in um, material science. It's, I mean, it's an approximation, but there's not a deliberate, coordinated effort to do that. And I've learned that material science, uh, basic, or I'm sorry, any basic research um, is. Um, is not very prescriptive. It's it's kind of loose, <laughs> which means as an army guy that likes to have an you know an operations order and um, to see the integration, um, it's it's not necessarily there. And we're going to have to figure that out. And um, 
you know, how do you integrate the efforts in basic science among all the players um, to, get, to get a more focused effort and, and to get, try to get a result sooner? Uh, and and this, this, is a, this one's hard. And, and uh, fortunately, Dale's going to figure it out because he's the guy that integrates all of the scientists. Yeah, I'd like to uh, kind of second that point. I think from an industry perspective, we don't do a lot of basic research in the materials area. Um, where industry has a role, I think, is, is in transitioning things more effectively, say, from academia to a, to a real application. Um, what we have found in the area of material science is that university partnerships, and I think government lab partnerships, can be very effective at the basic research level, I think the IP issues are, are addressable. Um, and, you know, if you want to use something that takes advantage of the latest in nanomaterials or bio-inspired materials or additive construction te constructive techniques like the 3D printing referred to earlier, or, or engineering materials that have desirable properties of mechanical, electrical, thermal, and so forth, um, those tend to be interdisciplinary um, opportunities done at centers that have a lot of capital equipment or set up for it. And I think universities actually fit that description um, fairly well. I think industry has the ability to take basic materials and do all the simulations and, you know, illities and so forth to see what their applicability would be and to accelerate their, their transition into a deployable system. But I, I think a model where we work a lot with academia and the, and the government labs would be well received at the basic end of the scale. And I, I would agree with everything you've heard from the other panel members that the, the collaboration has got to be uh, increased significantly. Um, you know, as we've said, the industry will invest. That's, that's what we do. That's how we make money. Uh, and with, with a bit more clarity and certainty and that, that that you know a program w will happen, happen when it's supposed to, and, and be the size that, it, that it's supposed to. That helps us focus our investments, and uh, and, and getting also helps the customer get what they want. So I think uh, you know the, the, through all these various means of uh, increasing collaboration, we'll we'll do the do the army well and the industry, and you see an acceleration of technology deployed into the field if we can you know make some of these things happen. Now we're going to talk about out-of-the-box thinking again. In some ways, perhaps many, the box in which the, in the past dozen years was defined by resources. Now that we are transitioning to an army of preparation, what defines the box? Are we, as an army, able to think outside of it? And what will be done to increase investment for future out-of-the-box thinking that doesn't directly contribute to a requirement today. Okay, well, I'll take on the start of that one. Um, so what I would argue is that in the 90s, ARL was pumping out ideas and they were going into the RDEX and the RDEX were taking those through the 6263 up through TL levels four, five, and sometimes up to six, and putting those technologies on the shelf that they had developed, putting them in cubby holes because there was not a need for it. And when we started into the fight in 2002 and on through the years, what happened is a lot of those technologies were pulled out of those cubby holes because we, the Army, moved and the research moved from a 15, 20, 30 year horizon to a six month to two year horizon because we entered into a fight that we were unprepared for doctrinally, tactically, materially. I mean, we were still, I mean, I was out at Leavenworth. When I was out at Leavenworth, they were still teaching, you know, the full gap scenario and counterinsurgency in 2004, 2005 was getting eight hours of classroom on it. So we, we were still thinking, okay, hey, another two years we'll be out of this fight and back to what we were before. But the RDEX were pulling this stuff off and transferring this intellectual property to the RDEX, to the REF, I mean to the PMs, the POs, the REF, and the industry, and they were taking those ideas and those technologies and turning them into capabilities that then were sent to the theater to solve the problems that the, the soldiers were facing. And I think a lot of that happened for the first six or seven years of the fight and continued on as we continued to develop things. And I think as we go through the next period, we'll see the same thing. As we continue to resource S&T, we will start putting back things on the cubby holes 
that are not needed and when the army needs them either because they have a threat they gotta deal with or they have the money to rent to modernize we'll start pulling those things off and feeding those things into the PM community and into industry to create the technologies that we need. I'll, I'll add to that real, real quickly. One of the things that we are doing is increasing within the S&T resources the investment that allows us to do prototyping and experimentation to get a better sense for what this technology capability could be. And we are trying to coordinate that so that we get it in the hands of soldiers who will give us that real-time feedback. And that is something that will then help refine what we are doing technology-wise and help refine our requirements. We know we've been successful in the past. You, you heard a lot about JLTV earlier today. And JLTV came after we did a future tactical truck system series of prototypes within the S&T base working with the PEO to understand what was in the art of the possible and establish a good solid requirement that then industry could capitalize on. And because we did that and worked closely with the PEO, understanding what capability we could bring, brought, bringing in our requirements team as well, we have shortened the timeline of acquisition for that particular program. And I would say that as a model of success, we need to exemplify. Um, sometimes you might have heard about acquisition, just the bureaucratic paperwork aspect of an acquisition ACAT-1 program has been timed out to take almost seven years, and that's going through all of the approval process and the average time to get those approvals. That's abhorrent, and we cannot stand to be that way in the future. Just a comment. And Mary, if I can give a, a thought on out-of-the-box uh, thinking, because Training and Doctrine Command has a, a res pretty big responsibility to try to help uh, guide that. But if we, thinking about that uh, deep future, that decade of uh, 2030 to 40, um, you know, what is the Army going to look like, or, th or the operational part of the Army? I mean, we, we have transitioned from a division-based Army to a brigade combat team, or based force. So what's it going to be in 2030 or 40? Um, so th there's a certain aspect of uh, where we have to do some blank sheet of paperwork. The, the temptation is always to, to go with what we know. You know, we know platoons and companies and battalions and brigades and divisions. Uh, we went through a period where we looked at units of action and units of employment that many of you all are very familiar with. Um, so we've got a lot of blank sheet of paper work to do for that deep future force. And there's two schools of thought on, on force design. One is that force designs are driven by concepts, um, which was General Starry's idea. So I've got to, as a, as a tradition, I've got to invoke one of the Training and Doctrine Command uh, fathers. Um, General Depew, um, arguably Tradoc's grandfather, argued that it was technology that drove force design. And my guess is if both of those men were alive today and here, they would probably argue that it depends, that you know, they both do. But the point is, we've got to balance what technology can deliver by, by working with those folks who, who understand that. And we've got to work hard on our conceptual work about how we might operate in the future and do some blank sheet of paper out of the box thinking on what that means for force design. Could I add just one quick comment and agree with everything that's been said? Sometimes our own belief in what the bureaucracy holds us accountable for causes us not to think out of the box. We think we have to go through all these reviews. They're sequential. Congress is going to act in a certain way if we don't do this or we don't get this document done. And in many cases, we can work within the bureaucracy to actually expedite it. One of those cases that Mary just mentioned is JLTV. We cut years off of JLTV getting it to production because of one PM really taking the program over and thinking out of the box. That PM who was a colonel then today is now a brigadier general. We need more people that will think a little bit differently. Yes, you have to work within the bureaucracy, but the bureaucracy shouldn't hold you down in terms of doing the right thing or seeking waivers or authority to get things done quicker, better, faster. And if I can just add to that from an industry perspective, the, uh, 
we've had to adapt, obviously, and as I mentioned previously, we've rethought our, our approach to the market as the market changes. Uh, you know, we used to be like all the other defense contractors, right? Uh, wait for the RFP, bid the box that they request in the specification, uh, sit back and wait for the results, execute the program, and chase the next one. Well, that doesn't work anymore, right? So we have to change the way we look at it, and we, we are doing that. But like all organizations, culture is, is the big thing, right? The Army, the government has their culture. We have our culture. Um, and as leaders, we have to change that culture, break that paradigm, you know, bring in fresh blood sometimes. Sometimes you have to, quote, unquote, blow up the organization. You have to do some things kind of radical to, to get people to snap out of the, their history. Having employees uh, that have been around for, for 25 years, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Um, so I, I think, you know, from the Army's perspective, as an organization like any other, uh, the leadership at the top's got to f find ways to, to not only encourage but expect that kind of, uh, let's say, radical thinking, but don't take status quo as the, as the uh, standard of the day. And that requires change, uh, changing people sometimes, changing the structure of your organization, not for change sake alone, but to put the right people in the right conditions to think out of the box, because the box is de generally the culture and the history. And to make that change, you've got to break up that culture and that history somewhat. Thank you. We've run out of time for the panel, and General Sullivan will uh, talk to the rest of the group for us. But thank you very much for being on the panel. Uh, and thank you very much for the questions. We will try to answer the ones that we didn't talk through.